Hello, welcome to my channel. Enjoy the video. Okay, let her talk to us and tell us who is Dr. Ya in a, in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, thank you, Tina, uh, for um, inviting me onto your uh, program. And um, I'm hoping that by the end of our um, dialogue that we would have enriched the life of women. Um, my name is uh, Ya Amankwa, uh, is my last name. And um, I am an OBGYN in Ottawa, Canada. Um, I'm a graduate of the University of Ghana Medical School, and I came out here. Marriage brought me this way, and um, mm. I then did my uh, residency um, in OBGYN in Ottawa at the University of Ottawa uh, here in Canada. And um, I subsequently went over to the States to do some extra training in uh, genital dermatology because there was an area that our hospital needed um, a specialist in. And I came back and I've been on staff and working there for 13 years now. Yeah. Um, my practice is varied. Um, I see um, antenatal patients, obstetric care. I'm part of a call group at the hospital um, where we deliver babies at the Ottawa um, General Hospital. And um, I also have a private practice um, where I do my gynae stuff. And um, I also have a lot of interest in menopausal women's health, um, midlife women, which a lot of us are in that range or getting there sometime soon. Um, and so, yeah, I have a varied practice. Um, I'm hoping that um, um, by the end of this show time, we would have. Um, wow, wow. That is awesome. That is so good to hear because then we have a, a whole lot of questions that we can ask to the OBGYN. But let's start by asking, so what, what, is, what does an OBGYN, what is the role of an OBGYN in the healthcare you know, spectrum and how, does that, how is that important to us as women? Um, because sometimes we know an OBGYN only because we are going to have a baby. Is that all you do? And what are, what are the things that you do on the whole? I think just the general education will help us. Mm -hmm. So um, it depends on where in the world you are. Um, so I can give a scenario of um, Canada and the US per se. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so in Canada, um, primary care for women is carried out by the general practitioner or your family doctor yeah. um, who will do your routine pap smears, order your mammograms, do your screening for cholesterol, check your blood pressure, all those things. And if there's an identified problem, they would refer you on to the OBGYN. So if you had an abnormal pap smear, then they would send you on to the OBGYN for specialized care. Um, mm -hmm. If you had some gynecological issues, um, heavy menstrual bleeding, you know, fibroids, if you had infertility, they would send you over to the OBGYN. Um, um, abnormal mammograms would go typically to the surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. But I know that in the US, the OBGYN plays kind of a bit of the role of um, what in Canada would say the family doctor does. So they would actually see you for your regular, you know, pap smears and right. order your mammograms and whatnot in the US. So that's a bit of a slightly different model of care. But in the end, our job encompasses women's health. So yeah. think of, you know, whatever it pertains to your gynecologic, your reproductive health, you know, screening, treatment, and of course, like antenatal care deliveries um, and postpartum care, you know. So it's quite a big range of things yeah. that we do. Also, um, of course, if unfortunately there's some gynae cancers, um, there are um, subspecialties in OBGYN where you'd be sent to the gynecologic oncologist who uh -huh. um, then takes over your care. So from benign to the spectrum of malignancy. Amazing, amazing. So for, yeah. for us as women, when we are going to a doctor or we are, as we are growing, let's start from you know 30s and up, what are some of the mm -hmm. things that we should be thinking about for reproductive health? Because okay. I have questions like, oh, they have, I mean, common things that you normally would see in the black community like the fibroids and all that. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that we should mm -hmm. be paying attention to as we grow up in terms of our reproductive health? So let's say even let's start from adolescence, like not necessarily mm -hmm. even at 30, like, you yeah. know, kind of your, you've had your period, um, you know, things seemingly going okay, or you can, you can also have a scenario where the periods are not even regular, like in right. young you know, and, and teenage girls, that could be normal for the first five years after your period okay. starts. You know, there's an axis that communicates from your brain to tell your ovaries 
to kind of ovulate every month, right? And sometimes there's the connection is off. Um, hormonally, it takes time for the body to mature. So within the first five years of um, having your periods, it's normal to have some irregularity. But then if by the time you're five years over, you're having irregular periods where your periods are more than, let's say 45 days apart or 60 days apart, or you can go months without a period, that's a red flag, right? So that should be a set. So with our teenage daughters, like if that's the case, they're 20, 21, you know, now 22, the periods are not regular. You need to find out why is this happening? Is this still just immaturity of that hormonal axis? Or are we talking about thyroid? issues that we're talking about some hormones that can be off you know and these are the things that can lead sometimes to infertility because if you're not ovulating regularly or the quality of your ovulation is not right that can be a challenge when you're trying to conceive so that would be kind of one aspect then as we get older like are the periods heavy right are they yeah. i mean some people come in they're like a walking ghost like literally they bled so much and they're used to it. Their body adapts to like heavy menstrual yeah. bleeding to the extent that they're walking around anemic and weak and frail and they don't even know, I just don't feel good. I just don't feel good, right? And that could be just severe anemia because think of it this way. If you have heavy, heavy menstrual periods and you're even taking iron pills, it's like pouring water into a sieve, right? You yeah. take the pills the next month, it's out. Take the pills the next month, you're bleeding it out. So you always can't keep, keep up with the, the loss, the menstrual loss. And, you know, mm -hmm. those heavy periods, it could be an underlying problem, like fibroids could be one of the reasons, right? Um, mm -hmm. There could be polyps in your uterus. That could be the reason as well. So if you're having heavy periods where you feel you're not feeling right, it's you should connect with your primary care and possibly get an ultrasound. You know, let's see if there's fibroids, let's see if there's polyps in your uterus, and then be kind of referred on. Um, then you could have um, other issues like, you know, um, like, you said subfertility, infertility, you know, those are red flags as well. Um, so these are some of the things. As Black women too, um, what I will say is that, you know, the amount of information you get, even when you go to a doctor, okay, yeah. depends on how knowledgeable you come across, sadly to mm. say, right? Because mm. sometimes you walk through the door and the first impression they have is that you're not happy highly educated or you're not well informed about your own health and um, so um, you go in if you don't ask questions you may not get every doctor has a different approach I would say most people right. try to convey information to you uh, you know in a way to make you understand but the more you ask questions the more knowledgeable you appear to be and that opens up um, the, the, the door for more interactions that would, you know, enable the doctor to give you some information that is lacking that you may not have otherwise gotten. So I would say that your health is in your hands. Like you literally need to have, I would say, a diary of your health. You should know how often a pap test done, right? In Canada, it's every three years. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you haven't had a pap test in three years, you should go and get a pap test. Like you don't wait. Nobody's going to reach out to you. Like in the, in the UK, you may get a letter saying you're overdue. In Canada, they would do it from time to time, but it's a hit and miss. So if you don't know that I haven't had a pap test in five years and you should be having one, you're already in trouble. Um, mm -hmm. Your mammograms, you know, sometimes you start at 40 and sometimes at 50, depends on where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't had a mammogram, and here in Canada, we do it every two years starting age 50, but we can offer it at age 40, right? So mm -hmm. if you're 55 and you've never had a mammogram, there's a problem there, right? So if you mm -hmm. have your pap test, you haven't had your mammogram, we should not be running like engines where we don't hear any sound. So we think everything is okay. Mm -hmm. Literally, we should go for regular, you send your car for, you know, maintenance, oh, maintenance. checkups. So why don't we, you know, kind of get into that spirit of, I need to maintain this body. What is due and who can I reach out to, you know? That is a great thing, Dr. Yeah, because I think one of the things that you said is we have to even keep an inventory of, you know, the things that we have to do. And I remember I had to find this app to track my menstrual cycle because it, at one time my OBGYN had asked, okay, what was your last menstrual cycle? I'm like, oh, okay, I don't remember. 
And that was like, um, well, you have their apps out there. There are things that you can use that you don't have to remember, but at least you can have a, a trail of, you know, this is what and this is when. And I thought mm -hmm. that was awesome. Now I can just, you know, when was this? I'll just give it to you. Okay, I can look in the app. So I think mm -hmm. that is a good thing because sometimes because we are not paying attention to it, we miss a lot of things in the process. So yes, you may not have any history of something in your family, but because you're not keeping track, something can just pop up out of the blue and it's like, oh, I, I could have done something about it. So That's I think right. that is a really important thing, just keeping track of the things and your health is in your own hands. That, that is so true. Hi, Auntie Abba, it's good to see you. You know, so I think that that is really helpful to know because one of the other things that um, the question was on the, you know, the self um, breast um, care, the check, your, check it yourself. A lot of us don't do it. You know, we just ride the waves and whenever we get to the doctor's office, that is what, what it is. How important is those breast checks on your own? Not even with the doctor, but on your own. How important are those? I would say there's been mixed messages over the years about mm. breast examination. So at first it was more of you go to the OBGYN or your primary care to get a breast exam and they would have paid different, you know, over the breast and figure out lumps. But actually we know that most breast cancers, apart from those smaller ones that are found, you know, with mammograms, a lot of them are discovered by the patient. The patient finds mm. a lump and they come and tell you, I found this lump. I was in the shower and I, felt this thing that's different, right? Yeah. So there is some, um, you know, there are proponents for um, the issue of self-breast examinations. If you had to do it, um, you would do it often, you know, after your period, because right before your period, the breast tends to be more dense and more painful and tender to chat, you know, to touch. So um, after your period before, you know, kind of within the first one or two weeks when the period has ended, you would kind of palpate the different quadrants and have a feel to see if there's something unusual. And, and mm -hmm. this way women have discovered uh, lesions. So we've kind of gone away. We almost never do that anymore where you go to a doctor, I'm coming for a breast exam and they kind of feel things around that's no longer existent in Canada. Um, and I believe in the States as well, um, everybody's gone towards you know, um, the, the regular screening. Because you think of it, by the time you can palpate a mass, it's actually way mm. bigger um, than a mammogram, you know, would pick it up in the very early stages. So I would say there is some value, but even stronger, you know, evidence for the regular screening with mammograms. Right, right. And you had mentioned something about the thyroid and, um, you know, the, the menstrual cycle, because I remember not, not too long ago, I had, I mean, my doctor picked up and said, oh, I think your thyroid is swollen or something. You have an enlarged thyroid. It, it may be causing some of your, you know, menstrual abnormalities and all that. How important is that? And do we even have any influence over that? Can we do anything about it in, in that mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. So um, thyroid um, disorders that cause abnormal uh, menstrual cycles are more, not typically always a mass, you know, in your neck, right? So mm -hmm. by the time you have a mass in your neck, that's a goiter. It may be active or not active with respect to thyroid hormone production. But I think the signal is the irregular period. So if you have irregular periods, one of the regular tests we do is check to check the thyroid. Um, as a woman yourself, we don't routinely check thyroid function, like, you know, as a checkup. If there's a family history of some immune, you know, related thyroid conditions, then um, the doctor may choose to check or you, you endorse some symptoms of if your thyroid is low, um, your thyroid hormones are low, it can cause mm -hmm. some weight gain, it can cause some cold intolerance, it can cause hair loss, you know, um, mm -hmm. and so those things would be the signal for, for the test to be run, you know, if your thyroid is too high, the thyroid function is too high, you can actually lose weights, which will be like, I'm not trying to lose weight and I've just lost weight. You can feel unusually warm, you know, uh, mm -hmm. um, your heart may be racing a bit faster than normal. So things like that, again, will warrant um, the test being done. But apart from that, we just don't routinely just check thyroid, you know, for the sake of it. It's often some, you know, some symptoms would lead us to check that. So to answer the question, what can be done about, you know, you can't do much about your thyroid regulation. It's all controlled from the brain, uh, yeah. sending hormones to stimulate the gland to make it. But if you have those symptoms that could be indicative of too high thyroid function or too low, 
then it would warrant uh, testing. I see. Wow. So in that case, I mean, for those of us who, are, or for a lot of us who see the doctor or the, we try to make appointments regularly, what are some of the things that even in our reproductive health, we still need to be doing in our general health that will help, you know, keep us you know, well, as we grow older, are there things that we can still manage on our, on our own? Absolutely. So um, if you think of like, um, we'll say reproductive health, but the, 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 um, the end result is, okay, let's see, ovulation, right? Healthy. Yeah. So, so, okay, you're doing, you're, you're checking your pap, you're doing your pap test regularly, right? Mm -hmm. um, your doctor would throw in um, at some stage over the age of 40, they will check your cholesterol, right? Um, regularly, they will check your blood pressure, they will check, um, you know, um, other like your bone health, depending on what stage you're at. So if you're looking at cholesterol, blood pressure, then those are all more like diet, exercise, right? Um, mm -hmm. Maintaining good healthy habits, not avoiding smoking, you know, um, um, alcohol in moderation, if you have to, um, things like that. So those things are within our control, because if you can manage those things, yes, there may be a family history part that you cannot escape, because sometimes some people have a family history of, you know, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. um, high cholesterol. It's not because they're not doing the right thing. So, but at least if you can modify those things personally, then it will alter that family history a bit, you know, a little may sprinkle over, but it won't be so bad, you know? So mm -hmm. um, from our end, that's what uh, we can be doing um, to um, have a healthier, you know, lifestyle. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Talk about how important um, we, we our stress level also contributes to our, you know, our menstrual cycle and even some of our, you know, reproductive health. Because last week we had um, Dr. Amor take us on another spin and he, he tried to tell us how important the why to getting well is important to our overall health. But now as you're talking, I'm thinking, how much can stress impact your whole cycle? and change mm -hmm. things, I mean, for, for a lot of us as we, we go on in life. Yeah, significantly. Um, so, but again, stress is the exclusion. So if you have um, irregular menstrual cycles, right? And you've had a full investigation and of course the history, you know, everybody lives on some kind of baseline stress, right? But how are you able to manage it, right? right. Um, do you exercise to release those endorphins to make you feel better, right? But if you anyone who goes through extreme stress, a few months later can have some changes in your menstrual cycle, but don't always attribute it to that. Like make okay. sure it gets investigated because when you go through stress, for example, stress of exams, a loss, you know, um, if it's chronic, it, it, an accident, things like that, it can affect yeah. the way your brain releases hormones to stimulate your ovaries, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that can definitely get your menstrual cycles off. But then how do you know that it wasn't a thyroid problem? How do you know that it wasn't a prolactin, another hormone problem, right? right. So you would kind of still have those um, investigations done. And if it's, you know, uh, boils down to stress, then at least um, that can be managed, you know, with um, the exercise and, and the, you know, being meditation and things that make you um, feel better, you know, apart from drugs, let's say, yeah. Right, right. So in, in that case, like some of the, the issues around fibroid, like what is a fibroid anyway? And, and how does it develop? Why is it so common in Black people? Let, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let me ask mm -hmm. that question. Okay. Yeah. So fibroids are growths, okay, of the mm -hmm. muscle of the uterus. So the muscle, the uterus is a muscle. And um, within that muscle, we can have these little growths. And in gynecology, we call them tumors. But when you say tumor to the lay person, you're freaking them out because they think it's cancer, mm -hmm. right? So cancer doesn't equal tumor. Cancer is a malignancy. A tumor is a growth. So, okay. so the fibroid is a growth or a tumor of the smooth muscle of the uterus. And it forms like little golf balls, right? And mm -hmm. these grow over time. Now, um, I'll come to the question of black people and fibroids, but um, the, the thing is that fibroids thrive on our female hormones. So the estrogen we make, um, which keeps our menstrual cycle going and yeah. you know, causes puberty, adolescence, all that stuff, also feeds the fibroids. So, oh, so yeah. long as you are making estrogen, if you have developed a fibroid, many more can show up or the existing ones can get bigger over time until you go into menopause. 
once women go into menopause, their estrogen levels fall. So you think of it, you've stopped, you've deprived the fibroid now of its food. There's no more estrogen. Mm. And as such, the fibroid can shrink by about 50%. So um, that's how fibroids behave. Now, um, they are very common. We normally give statistics of about 60% of all women by the time they're 50 years old will have fibroids. And black women, maybe more like 70 to 80% by the age of 50 have fibroids. Now, the question is as to whether these fibroids are causing a problem or not, is what will warrant um, um, treatment. So the fact that you have a fibroid doesn't mean it has to be treated. It depends on how Mm -hmm. big they are, how many they are, where they are located in the uterus and what symptoms they're causing you, right? So I can come to that later, but with black women, we're not hundred percent sure. This seems to be some kind of a genetic predisposition, you know, but Mm -hmm. we're not sure why that is the case. Um, And a lot of um, um, black women as well, due to the fact that access to care, it's not always Mm -hmm. available, or even if they had these symptoms, they don't always seek um, medical attention early when they are found to have fibroids, they are much bigger, right? Because they never had checkups or they minimize their symptoms. And so by the time you found out, it's massive, you know? And so Mm. that's why it can also come across like they have huge fibroids, but it's also, you know, the interventions are later. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, So it's pretty common, you're saying, in women generally. Mm -hmm. Just Mm -hmm. if you're not paying attention to it, then yes, it will will hide Mm -hmm. to see it come up mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. so if, if you have fibroids can you still and it's not bothering you i mean is it okay you can just let it be because i know a few women who have done surgeries to take out a fibroid or something mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's still some of them came back so that's I right mean, <laughs> so yeah. so so fibroids are very elusive with respect to treatment so you always have to have your treatment goal so it starts off by what are your symptoms right so Fibroids can present with varied symptoms. So you can just have like someone would have heavy menstrual bleeding and that's what gets a fibroid discovered. So they have an ultrasound and then they find out that they have a fibroid, right? Mm -hmm. Fibroids could also present with, like I said, no symptoms, heavy menstrual bleeding. And then you can have also pressure effects. So if you think of this golf ball growing and growing and now it's like a grapefruit and now it's like a watermelon, you know, you start to have pressure symptoms. So you may start to experience having to go to the bathroom frequently when you haven't drank that much water or tea or coffee. You just find, find yourself frequent in the bathroom quite a bit because it's putting pressure on your bladder or your cloth size is getting bigger. And it's not just the carbs you've been eating, right? It's kind mm-hmm. of, and it's not just the menopause that's happening, the perimenopause or whatever, because the fibroid could be growing. So, so um, that could present with increasing abdominal size and, and cosmetic things that would drive you to the doctor. Um, and then with part of the pressure symptoms is sometimes, you know, sexual intercourse can be uncomfortable because you can have a fibroid sitting, you know, mm-hmm. quite low down and, 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 and causing all these symptoms. Then, of course, the infertility can be one of the issues. Now, um, fibroids do not necessarily cause infertility. A lot of our patients come pregnant and I'm, I, I examine their belly there only 12 weeks. And I'm like, why is your uterus feeling like 20 weeks? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, let's get an ultrasound. Oh, great. You have fibroids that are making you five months pregnant, but you're only, you know, two months pregnant. Right. So, so um, people get pregnant with fibroids all the time. So Mm. if you have a woman who is suffering from infertility or subfertility um, and fibroids are noted, um, it does not mean that the fibroids are causing the infertility and it does not mean that they should have surgery per se. It depends on where the fibroids are located. So they start off all in the muscle, right? But some have the tendency to grow towards the outside of the uterus, like a bunny ear sitting on the outside. So those don't Mm -hmm. affect fertility because they're not in the cavity where the baby is going to be sitting or is sitting, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But then those those fibroids that grow towards the uterine cavity where the baby would be sitting, um, you know, they can cause sometimes issues with people may have frequent miscarriages if they have um, a fibroid sitting right in the cavity. Or if you have a fibroid also going towards where the tubes are, right? They could kind mm. of block mm. block the tube. So the sperm and the egg cannot meet in the tube because the fibroid is sitting in the way. So fibroid doesn't equal infertility. If you have fibroids that are suffering from infertility, you are on the full workup because we know that infertility is multifactorial. 
30 percent could be related to the woman another 30 or so to the man 30 percent to both and 10 percent is unexplained so mm -hmm. we need to be careful when we keep attributing fibroids to infertility mm -hmm. amazing amazing now yeah. that you're talking infertility let's talk about that for a few minutes because i think in our community that is huge and every time there's an infertility issue, it's more of the woman that is, you know, um, at fault for, you know, not being able to have a child and all that. Explain it a bit more because you just said that it's 30, 30, and then there's another 30 and then the 10 is unknown. So in that case, I mean, I know we, we women normally take it on, on ourselves and makes it look like I am the one who is not able to give the babies and all that. But, Help us understand how important it is for us to also look at it holistically as, as opposed to just taking on the whole blame, like we have to be the ones doing something. Yeah. That's right. So if we think of, let, let's address the female factor fa first, like um, when it comes to, to the woman. So you think of it, generally you need a healthy sperm, you need good quality eggs, and you need a tube that's open right? Mm -hmm. So the sperm must be able to go there, meet a good quality egg, form an embryo that then rolls into the uterus and you need a healthy uterus to be able to carry. So you, you need all these things. So where the woman's role is in this could be if you're suffering from infertility, is it because one, your ovulation is not happening regularly or when it happens, is it a good quality or not, right? So mm -hmm. there's some women who have a condition called polycystic ovarian disease or PCOS, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, where they do have eggs, but they are not releasing them every month, right? Um, some of these women may be quite on the overweight side. Some of them may be skinny too. Um, so with these women who are not ovulating regularly, if we deem that you do have enough eggs though, you could take medications to help you ovulate regularly. Um, assuming the tube is open and the sperm is good, you can conceive, right? right. Now, so that's ovulation factors. There's also some women who are still ovulating, but unfortunately their eggs are old. It's almost like they are almost near menopause and yet they are only in their twenties, right? Mm. It's called premature ovarian insufficiency or in the past they used to call it premature ovarian failure. So the fact that you're ovulating every now and then and you're not conceiving, it could be again back to egg issues. Mm. Then we have the tubal factors, right? So are the tubes open, right? So women may have conditions that cause the tube to be blocked, right? For example, they may have had some infections when they were you know, younger in the past, and these infections may have blocked the tubes, right? Like sexually transmitted infections, you know, silent ones that they did not know about, blocked the tube, or they were treated, but then the harm had already been caused. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a condition called endometriosis that mm -hmm. you know, affects a woman and it can cause scarring you know, in, the, in the pelvis. It's, it's, and all this scar tissue can literally constrict the tube on the outside so that it's not open for the sperm and the egg to meet. So those are the tubal factors, right? Yeah. Then we talk about the uterine factors. So do you have a hostile uterine environment? For example, so many fibroids that are crowding out the space you know, that... Um, there's no good point for implantation and things like that. So that would be the issues related to the woman, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be our 30%. So then 30%. how about the other 30? Yeah, mm -hmm. how about the other 30 from the guy, right? So the ability to have an erection or an ejaculation doesn't mean good sperm, right? So unfortunately, men can suffer from sperm issues as well, where sometimes the ejaculates could have no sperm whatsoever in there, which is a surprise to people, but you mm. know, the ejaculate is made up of sperm, but there's also other glands around that produce secretions to form the ejaculate. So the fact that they're having an ejaculate doesn't mean that the sperm is coming through. Some of them also, when they have conditions like diabetes and things like that, could cause the sperm to go in the reverse direction. We call it retrograde ejaculation. So instead of coming out, it's kind of going a bit backwards. So they're not having the sperm put out, right? They could have suffered you know, some trauma from their testes when they were younger. So again, the sperm is not being made. Or sometimes there are sperms, but the quality is not good because mm -hmm. every sperm needs a head and a body and a tail. Then they have to be moving in a certain direction. So it's not only the amount of sperm, but it is the ability of how, how, how does the sperm look? Is it abnormal? And how does the sperm move? So you can have a good wow. number of sperm 
But then if, if a bunch of them look abnormal or they're not moving in the right direction, like moving such that they can be moving into the tubes and towards the egg, um, then you may not be able to conceive. So that's why sometimes you hear of stories of, you know, um, like we said back home in the past when there was never like in Africa, you know, other parts of the world mm -hmm. where it's always a woman's fault, um, they never investigated the men. But you will find out that maybe the relationship didn't work out. The woman met another man and bang, she had five kids, right? How do yeah. you explain that? It was nothing to do with her eggs or the, the tubes. It was a sperm factor, most likely, you know. Um, and then sometimes you investigate the couple. The woman has great eggs. Her tubes are good. The sperm is good. But they just can't get pregnant. And that is what we call unexplained. Like, we don't know why. Yeah. And these are the people who tell you that, you know, we had IVF or, or, you know, some fertility treatment. We had one kid and after that, we just started to conceive, you know, and we don't know why, right? So that's one of the mysteries of medicine. We don't have, always have answers to everything, but um, yeah. sometimes it can spontaneously happen. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing. It's just amazing to hear that it's more than just one-sided as we've always thought and as we've heard and how it's even pushed around. And even now, even now, with all the advancement and everything, there's still a lot of pressure on the woman, you know, That's when right. there's no baby coming, it's like, you know, and I think that sometimes just that pressure also doesn't help with the situation, you know, mm -hmm. so like, I think, let me pause here and just take a minute to address women who are in that place today, they want to have the baby, they've done all they have to do, and there's just mountain pressure, they feel so sad when they see that their husband is carrying someone's baby and is happy and is like, I cannot give the baby and all that. What are some of the things they can do to calm themselves down in the midst of this all as they wait? You know? So it's a very difficult place to be. And unless you've been yeah. there, you would have no idea. You know, you can only empathize, but you have no idea how painful this may be for women. And it's a big grieving process. And you know, sometimes as time passes by, you realize that it's, you know, time is running out. But um, I would say, first of all, if you have had the, you know, the full investigation, right? And it depends on what the, the cause is, right? Because mm -hmm. sadly enough, sometimes we tell women that, you know what, your egg quality is not good and you would need to get a donor egg, right? Like you'd have to have an egg donor. Now, this is all privacy between you and your doctor. You have no idea how many couples have a baby that it's never the woman's egg or it's not her husband's sperm because sometimes her eggs are good, but the mm -hmm. husband's sperm is not good. So we have donor sperms, right? Yeah. You can actually pick a donor who looks, you know, kind of, you can get that characteristic. So you want a black person, you want a mixed person, whatever it is, they have all the features of these donors. You can have their intellectual, you know, abilities. They have all that profile. So sometimes they may opt to take a donor sperm and conceive and have kids and nobody else, nobody except the couple know that this is not the man's biological child, right? So mm. if the couple can come to those, you know, there's lots of medical things out there. So if only your personal beliefs or your religious beliefs could, you know, not be a barrier and it's acceptable to you as a couple, you could have kids of your own in quotes um, and that could also help, you know, relieve that stress. So, be, but these are expensive. The, the donor sperm actually is not as expensive as, as the donor egg, right? So there could be financial barriers that prevent, right. you know, the woman from, um, from being able to, to um, get a donor egg. But if the finances are available, that's an option. A donor sperm is an option. Also, you can have a surrogate, right? Because your uterus may be full of fibroids, not able to carry, but maybe your eggs are good, right? Mm -hmm. And your husband's sperm is good. They can put them together in IVF. It is your biological embryo that can be put in someone to carry for you and you could have a baby as well, right? And then mm -hmm. there's also options of adoption. You know, we sometimes overlook that, you know, right. um, that may also sometimes meet that, you know, instinct of wanting to be parents and also provide, you know, hope for kids who um, may not have a future um, without being adopted, you know. So those are certain things because there's ever so much, you know, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, I mean, yes, you can pray, you can trust God, 
Um, but I always like to say, let's put this in combination with what is out there also for us. Let's put out, continue to have faith, you know, but also yes. let's blend it with the works, you know, and, yes. and then yes. sometimes okay. we can have a fulfilling outcome. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I like that. It's just, I know for a lot of, like you said, Christians, it's like, oh, a donut egg is like, you know, completely out of my um, religious scope. And that's fine. But at, at least there are options out there. So as you're that's praying, right. you have mm -hmm. to also look at options as they present themselves and see what, right. what, what, you can, what you can do and what you cannot do. You know, but as we are on the same issue of fertility, Let's talk about miscarriages. I, um, I know a couple of um, people who've had miscarriages and they've tried over and over and it's, it's hard. It's really hard on the woman, especially because sometimes like 12 weeks is four weeks and all that. Let's talk about why do they happen? And um, what are some of the things that, if, if there are any that we can do <laughs> on our end, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so first of all, miscarriages are very common. Okay. 15, as in one five percent of pregnancies result in miscarriages. And until it happens, mm -hmm. you have no idea. 15% of pregnancies result in miscarriages. Yes. So it's quite high. And in the world of gynecology, much as it may sound very morbid, we actually don't start investigating women for reasons of miscarriage until they've had three. So really? in, in the world of gynecology, one miscarriage is allowed because chance happens. Two miscarriages are allowed. And by three, we're like, oh, maybe there's something wrong. We should be looking here, right? But mm -hmm. what woman wants to wait for three miscarriages before they mm -hmm. start getting investigated? So we get these questions a lot. So a woman has one miscarriage. She goes onto Dr. Google and she, lists, she looks <laughs> at all the possible reasons. Was it because we had sex? Was it because I ate this? Was it because I went on a bumpy ride? And again, let's not kill ourselves. Like this happens. Okay, but again, once you've had three, then we start looking for the reason. Now, what are some of the reasons? Um, it could range from, again, a hostile uterine environment, right? So do you have some fibroids that are protruding into the uterine cavity? So yes, the egg was able to meet the sperm somewhere, the embryo rolled into the cavity, but then it would not sit because there's all this fibroid sitting in there. Could that be a reason? That's a possibility. Sometimes you could have polyps or other growths in the uterus. That may be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes too, it could be related to um, um, what we call abnormalities with the fetus, like karyotype abnormalities, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes if you have um, the chromosomal makeup of the fetus is not right, sometimes nature will, will kind of make it pass. Um, sometimes too, it could be some um, genetic things going on with both parents. So um, mm -hmm. sometimes the genetic counselors would run some genetic tests on both parents to see if there's something that um, is coming through that's preventing the fetuses from staying, right? Um, then also there's some blood condition sometimes. Now kind of we say less and less of that. There's some blood conditions called thrombophilias, which can cause women to, to kind of have sometimes fetal demise, you know, when it's further along in the pregnancy. Um, in the past, we used to investigate in full for these thrombophilias causing, um, you know, miscarriages. So there could be a number of reasons, but mm -hmm. sometimes too, painfully enough, we don't find reasons. We don't find reasons. Wow. Yes. Wow. Amazing. And that, that's, the, that's the thing. You, you said it before. You said medical science doesn't have all the answers, you know? So yeah. we, we do what we can and that's the rest right. is really in God's hands to, mm -hmm. yeah, and I keep, I keep telling some of my, you know, friends and I tell them it's God who gives a child, really. It's, I mean, we do what we can, but he does give a child. We have really no hand in it. Yes. I'll give you an example. One of my patients, she had infertility for 10 years. She went through IVF. She never conceived then she uh, conceived spontaneously. So that was great. I mean, of course, that was a very anxiety provoking pregnancy. She could never come in and spend only 10 minutes. It was like, you know, everything was a big deal because this was everybody's baby's precious, whether it's baby number 10 or 11. But for her, it was like, I am the focus and it's gotta be this, you know, you cannot like everything has to go right. So she has her baby. Um, subsequently within a year or two, she's pregnant again. She has a second, okay. 
And then she's like, okay, I'm done. I don't want any more. I just want two because now I'm, you know, whatever in my late thirties and whatnot. So she gets an IUD and guess what? She gets pregnant with the IUD in. So we pull out the IUD and now she's having baby number three for somebody who had infertility for 10 years, IVF never worked. There was no reason, you know, so, so these mysteries exist, right? And like you said, you just have to do your part, get investigations, get treatments available to you, pray. And, you know, sometimes you just have to wait painfully. Yeah. It's long, but, you know. Yeah, it's long, yeah. but sometimes you just have to wait. That's very, yeah. yes. That, that, that is the truth. You know, as we were talking, I think one thing that I, I wanted to ask was about the fertility range, right? Because I've had people who were in their mid thirties and they've been given a whole lot of lecture by the doctor OBGYN, like help us understand that range of fertility, which of course there will always be the exception, like God, that's what he wants to do. Right. But what is that range of fertility that women should be thinking about? Because I, I, I have seen like 33 and the pressure that you have to do this, you have to do this test and you have to do so many things. It's just like, whoa, for just one pregnancy, you know? Yeah. 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 So um, I would say that um, as doctors, our due diligence is kind of also to educate people. So when you have that pregnant woman who's, you know, 34 and she's coming to renew her birth control pill or now she wants another IUD for five years and she has a, you know, she has a, a stable partner relationship, my question is, are you thinking kids, right? Because a lot of people are not aware. Like, you know, like these days it's almost like you cannot have a child and live in an apartment. Who said so? Like you need to have the car, you need to have the house, you need to have this, the job, you know, all that stuff right. all cooked. Then now you're ready to have babies and it's not happening, right? So because we see it so much, it's almost like your parents telling you, things over and over again, because you see so much, you cannot close your eyes. To it. So I always ask like, what are, you know, what are your plans? You know, because we know that after age 35, the air quality starts to decline and very rapidly by age 40, right? So mm-hmm. this is the general statistics. Having said that, there are, you know, some black women tend to ovulate later and later. Like, you know, they may not stop having, they may not go into menopause until they are 58 or 59 or 60, right? So for those black women, in their mid forties, they could still be making good quality eggs. So you would see them reproduce and have more and more kids, but we're looking at the general, you know, statistics, right? So at 35, air quality starts to go down and then by 40, air quality declines quickly. So in our um, hospital at the fertility center, actually, if you're 40 and you're coming in saying, you know what, I can't, I can't conceive. Um, The first thing they're going to tell you is go get an egg donor, right? Like you're going to get that. Even if, you're, even if you're having periods, right? Um, they may do an ultrasound and say, oh, you have a few eggs, that will do, but y- you're gonna get. So that's where this pressure is coming from. So our peak times of fertility are definitely after puberty. You know, you may not be ready for that then, but you know, definitely after puberty. And then by the time you're hitting your mid thirties, the air quality is going down and down. And by 40, there's a rapid decline. So the chances get less and less and the risk of miscarriage gets higher as you get over 40. So you may have a very hard time conceiving. And when you do, miscarriage rate is higher. And also mm-hmm. the risk of chromosomal anomalies like Down syndrome and stuff also, you know, um, can also increase, you know. So that's why women feel the pressure, you know, it's just doctors trying to do their due diligence, um, but that's the way nature has our bodies going. Wow, mm-hmm. wow. Let's talk about pre-menopause. Can you have early menopause and what causes that? Because I, I had it from my um, doctor recently and I'm like, oh, people have early menopause. What is that? And how does that happen? Okay. So, so the average age of menopause is 50, 51 in Caucasians. And Black people, a little bit later, maybe 55, 56. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, 10 years before, anywhere from about 10 years before you're destined to have menopause and by the way just to define menopause it is the last menstrual period you will have after which no more periods okay it's not the hot flashes and the night sweats those are just symptoms of menopause but your menopause is that final period you would have okay now if you're destined to stop having periods at 50 or 51 when you're in your early 40s you can start having hot flashes and irregular periods irregular cycles you know 
things like that, those are all the perimenopause. It's your body transitioning, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you stop having periods by age 41, we call it early menopause, okay? Because, you know, that's between 41 and 45, it's called early. If you're younger than 40 and you run out of X and you stop having periods, that's a term I said is called the premature ovarian insufficiency or premature ovarian failure. So, so if all these symptoms are happening before age 45-ish, we'll just say that's a bit early, but anything from 45 onwards is normal. So if you're mm -hmm. 45 and you're starting to have space out periods and hot flashes and nights where that's perimenopause, you're in, the, you're in the normal range. That's not early, you know? Early mm -hmm. is 40 to 45 and younger than 40 is a premature ovarian insufficiency. There are varied causes. The early menopause, if you stop having periods before 40, you know, the premature ovarian insufficiency, there's different reasons. Sometimes it is immune condition. So we have to test some antibodies to your thyroid that could be affecting the ovary. Um, people can also go into, into that situation from treatment. So like you've had repeated ovarian surgery, you know, you've had cysts over and over, they're taken out, it can damage the core of the ovary, causing your ovaries to give up sooner, right? It can also be related to treatments like you've had chemotherapy, radiation, you know, which damages the ovaries, right? Um, and then sometimes the big kind of worms, we don't know why, some people can stop having it early. So that is very devastating for a lot of women mm. because often they may not know. So let's say if someone goes on the birth control pill when they are in their late teens or early 20s, they were on the pill. The pill is going to give you these fake periods. So every month you get a period, life is good. You know, you get in your period, think things are okay. Then suddenly you're 29 or 30 and you decide, okay, now I'm ready to have a kid. I'm going to come off the pill. You come off the pill and your period never comes. And that is not, the pill did not cause you to go into ovarian failure or ovarian insufficiency. You had it already, but the pill masked it because the pill was giving you all these fake periods. So you didn't know what was happening with your body naturally. And now you were ready. The period never came. You went to see the doctor. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, you're in menopause. At 30 or at 25, devastating, right? So these are some of the things we see. So in that case, I mean, now that, let me go back to the younger girls and our younger kids growing up. Now 12, 13, they have their periods coming and all that, you know, and once they start having their periods, the doctor, when you go with them to the doctor's office, is like, you mom, you can sit outside. We need to talk to her privately and all that. Is it advisable that they get on a birth control that early? So it depends on the reason. So there are some young girls who actually have severe pain with their periods where they actually faint or they vomit like due to the pain associated with their periods um, or they have heavy prolonged periods that brings them to the ER. They re may require blood transfusions. Um, and with that, they're losing time from school. They're not themselves, you know, they're not functioning well. They can't play sports, you know, for several days a month. In those scenarios, we recommend that they could go on the pill for sure. And, you know, this is what I always tell parents. Your daughter will not become sexually active because she's on birth control. They will do it if they want to, if they have birth control or not, right? They can go to the store and buy condoms. So the fact that they have birth control doesn't mean that they're going to decide then to be active. It's, it's a decision they make irrespective of them being on birth control or not. So yeah. a lot of parents fear that, oh my God, putting them on it is going to you know, cause them to be active. That should not be a fear. I think more people too are worried about, oh, the chemicals you're putting into their body and what is it causing and all that stuff. So right. it is stopping ovulation and stopping the ovulation is what decreases the pain with the periods and reduces the heaviness, right? So it is okay if that is deemed to be the appropriate treatment for them. Sometimes they need to be on that. But what I would say is, you know, if let's say by that time they're 12 or 13, they have to go on the pill. Now they're 18 or 19. Remember I talked about the five years, right? So yeah. the five year window are the periods now more regular. She's not hemorrhaging, you know, all the time. Do you want to take a break? Maybe when she's 20 or 21 and see what are these like now? If she's not sexually active and doesn't need contraception, right? So you want to take a break and then see if, you know, are things any better with respect to regularity or not? Um, and, and then you can get a sense of what your body is doing naturally because you've kind of masked everything with a pill for all those years. It may be one way to do it too, but it's not a wrong approach. Wow. 
I think you, we need some help here. Um, now that we're talking about the younger girls, especially for those of us who are um, having these teenagers come up and all that. I think we are going to switch uh, and go to more like parents mode. What are some of the things that we should be definitely talking about with our teenage daughters now that they are starting to have their menses and all that, that you would tell them, or we should also be, you know, buttressing when we are home with them because we have a culture that we don't talk about things. Um, That's home, right. I don't know what we would do, but yeah, you know, just enough for, of what you know is enough. But this is a, an age that we are in that everything is out there, right? And we yeah. are still struggling with the communication. So what, what advice would you give us as um, you know, parents with teenage daughters or even younger adults that we should be having these conversations with? So I would say that a lot of the challenges come from the parents being uncomfortable because the yeah. kids know it all. You don't, you have no idea what they know. They go to school, they have the internet, they watch shows, there's, you know, all sorts of stuff out there. So my approach is you want to tell them your way before somebody else tells them the way you don't want it, right? right. So, I mean, you need to have that frank discussion. And like you rightly said, culturally, it may not have been done growing up, but you need to have that schedule. You know what? We need to have a chat. And it is, okay, explain this whole puberty thing. They may have done it in science, you know, in, in, in school. But then I think the importance of, okay, your menstrual cycle, what does that mean? You know, you may you could get pregnant if you were sexually active, you know, um, what measures. And again, it depends when you're Christians is very hard because you are teaching, you know, marriage, sex is for marriage, you know, um, all that stuff, those values that you're trying to put across that um, um, they may not have had otherwise. Right. So mm -hmm. you would put it in the context of what your personal beliefs are and how you think that as a family, it should be, they may or may not take it, but at least you can give your stand. And then on the other hand, it's like, well, if you were to do this, these are the consequences, you know that already, right? But yeah. it should also, also be an open environment such that they can come and talk to you, that they don't feel, if something was to go wrong, they don't feel like they're gonna be so judged, right? So it really has to be that open relationship where they can come and talk to you. And if they were going to be sexually active, then, we're talking about pregnancy prevention and sexually transmitted infections prevention, right? Because the fact that you're on a birth control pill doesn't prevent you from getting chlamydia or chlamydia. You need to use condoms, like, you know, if you, you're intimate, right? And things like mm -hmm. that. We also talk about the HPV vaccine. Now that's another huge thing because mm -hmm. I know a lot of mothers are reluctant and I would um, admonish our, our clientele who are listening today, our audience that, you know, do not be afraid to give your children the HPV vaccine. The HPV vaccine, prevents against genital warts, which genital warts will not kill you, but it's a heavy burden on, 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 on women and men, you know, because you can have warts on the penis, you can have warts on the vulva, you know, so genital warts. And then the higher um, kind of, the higher grade of the virus that causes the warts, the more uh, cancerous ones is what causes cancer of the cervix, right? So people say, oh, you know what? My kid is not having sex. They're Christian kids, they're good kids, so they don't need the vaccine. Listen, you don't know who they're going to meet in the future, right? You could keep yourself a virgin until the day you marry, but that somebody you married has been with a few other people and they have the HPV virus. They're going to bring it to you. You're going to get what? You could get cervical cancer, right? So you're mm -hmm. doing it more to protect yourself, not because you are promiscuous, but it's more like future. You can never tell who you're going to be in a relationship with. So um, mm -hmm. those are certain things. So you need to have those frank discussions and allow the kids to be open and talk to you, you know, uh, and advise them without being judgmental. Amazing. I think that is a really good point about the vaccine because we, we, we do that. We, we think that way. We say that, yeah, they're not doing anything, so they don't need that vaccine. And we pass on that. But like you said, rightfully, you can do all the right things, but you don't know the, what the next person or the person you meet is doing. So it's really important that we keep up with the things that we have to do on our part just to protect mm -hmm. ourselves as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome, awesome. I think our time is almost up. If you have questions that I haven't tackled, we will definitely circle back or you can ask and we will, we will come back and look at it um, and answer the questions. But this has been really good. It's been good information for us from you know, menopause all the way to our children um, getting into the teenage and 
all the conversations that have to happen and the things that we should be doing. I think a quick question on tampons and then pads, right? So I've had people, you know, argue strongly for one or the other. What are your thoughts? I mean, are tampons not good? I think it's just because I wasn't used to it growing up or I didn't have access to it. So I, I, I mean, I'm more comfortable with a pad than with a tampon. But is, that, is there um, any health issues with a tampon versus a pad? The only health issue with a tampon is if you forget it in place. Mm. There's something called toxic shock syndrome where you leave a pad, a tampon in your vagina for days on end and you forget about it. And that tends to happen if you're using the tampon towards the lighter part of your period. So like normally when you're in the middle of a period and it's kind of a bit heavier and it's full and it's soaking, you remember to change it, right? Because, but then some people will put it in even when they are the end, right? And if you forget that, then that can actually lead to a serious infection that can go into your bloodstream and, and it's very fatal. So that's the only thing with a tampon. Now, um, it, it, if you think of it, um, a lot of young people find it convenient because you know, um, sometimes if they're doing competitive, I mean, swimming, things like that, yeah. right? A pad is not ideal. So a tampon works well and, and you know, would um, be better than the pad, right? But it's an issue of personal preference and what people are comfortable with. Like you rightly said, growing up, um, it was more pad. So tampon seems so off, but there's mm -hmm. really nothing wrong. And if only the girl is comfortable because it has to be put like, you know, into the vagina through the hymen, right? So it kind of takes a bit of comfort, you know, to kind of to do that right but if okay. they can get comfortable with that then that's okay you know okay i think i have a few questions for you um okay. what is um hormone therapy right hormone therapy and can you talk about that a bit um hrt okay yeah so um it used to be called hormone replacement therapy that was what the r is for but now it's called hormone therapy uh, okay. because we're not looking to replace any missing hormones so when you have thyroid dysfunction, your thyroid gland isn't working well, we give you a replacement in form of thyroid hormones. But with menopause, you're meant to have no estrogen, right? By the time you're in menopause, you've run out of eggs, you're not making more any estrogen. The reason we give hormone therapy is for women who have symptoms that is affecting their quality of life. So if you go into menopause and you start having these hot flashes, these night sweats that are preventing you from sleeping well. You wake up in the morning, you're not rested, you cannot, then it starts to affect your focus, you cannot function, you're not the nicest person, you're irritable, you're biting everybody's head off, you know, you're just miserable. Um, in the ideal setting, we would assess you and we would give you hormone therapy, which is giving you back some estrogen to take away those symptoms. But the estrogen mm -hmm. we give can stimulate your uterine lining, you know, to cause cancer. So because of that, we give progesterone, which is another hormone to counteract that. So hormone therapy is normally given estrogen and progesterone, you know, kind of to relieve the woman's hot flashes. So it is, it works. It's great for ideal candidates and um, uh, we just have to do the appropriate screening. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Hot flashes and all the fun stuff that come up in life, you know. But I think we, we've had a really good educational session with you. We, we really have a lot to go back and think about and just process around fertility and infertility. Just, you know, we couldn't tackle everything, but I think we have enough tools. So for those of us who may have hybrids, there are things that we've said today that it's it doesn't equal infertility. You can actually have you know, um, kids with the fibroid and all that. So these are things that you can go back and talk to your BGYN. Remember what um, Dr. Yaya had said at the beginning, that the more questions you ask, you know, the more your doctor is engaged to talk more about things with you. So let's take this knowledge and not just sit on it, but start having those conversations so that we can get more out of our doctors and our, our primary care or OBGYNs that we are working with and continue to get the care that we need. So Dr. Ya, in closing, in closing, I know we couldn't tackle everything, so we may have another session another time. But in closing, what are some of the things, key takeaways you want us to walk away with as women, as um, Christians, as um, you know, just people who want to do well and keep well in our reproductive health? So what I would say is that as women, we need to remember that we need to be healthy to care for all those people that were working hard and 
toiling day in and day out for, right? So yeah. there's no value for your kids without a mother if there's something that you could have done, you know, to prevent the things, some health conditions that are preventable, right? So um, mm -hmm. let's remember that one, we need to be healthy for those around us. So we need to take time to look after ourselves. We own our own health. Don't reach out, expect people to reach out to you to tell you it's time for your mama, grandma, it's time for your pap smear. You need to have a health diary and put in, how often should I be doing this? When did yeah. I last do it? Um, should I be reaching out, right? Yeah. As black women, we need to, like I said, ask more questions, um, come across as knowledgeable because sadly enough, sometimes we're just branded as we don't know much or right. you know we we're not educated or we're not com complicated enough to understand things so <laughs> we have to come across that that's not the case and um as christian women and mothers and sisters um um yes we need to we need to pray we need to you know um get our families under the anointing of the spirit pray for them um, pray with them um, and um, also let's combine our faith with what's out there um, because there's reasons why these medical interventions exist and let's yeah. take advantage of that but use prayer to also back it up it's not two exclusive things amazing amazing thank you so much Dr. Yao for making time for us this afternoon and being with us explaining things I mean you've made it look so easy for some lay, lay people like us, we can easily follow the things and we can understand it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing. I, I, I'm so blessed. I'm so excited that we, we could sit and chat with you. We own our health. You had it. Let's go out there. Let's own it. Let's, be, let's do what we can. Again, it's not exclusive. The prayer is good. And then owning our health is also the same as good as a prayer because together, God is keeping us and he's also expecting us to do what we can to keep alive and do what he wants us to do here. Hello, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something that will help you today in your life journey. Make sure to subscribe, like, share, and come back for more videos to encourage you to become a masterpiece. See you soon.